Well, welcome everybody. Uh, this is our second BMSB webinar. Uh, we're presenting live from Sydney, Australia. Uh, we've had a fantastic attendance uh, over the last couple of days. So thank you everyone for uh, registering and coming in. Now we've got people locally from, uh, or customers from Australia, uh, also across the ditch in New Zealand and across the globe. So a very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. So we're here today to talk about the Australian BMSB uh, and the measures obviously that uh, will be introduced as of the 1st of September. So very important for our industry. And again, these change quite rapidly every year. Um, so we've got our subject matter expert that has presented a uh, presentation here and trying to capture everything in regards to the, the new BMSB uh, measures. So before I introduce you to my colleague Kane, uh, we'd like to play a very short video from the primary industry. So let's just play that now. Join the bug hunt. It's summer and it's fruit season. Beautiful produce is grown here for us Aussies to eat and for export. But imagine a bug that can ruin all this. The brown marmorated stink bug. It eats, sucks and spoils our grapes, apples, corn, tomatoes and stone fruit, destroying industry and our home veggie patches too. So let's avoid a bug nightmare. Over winter, they invade and multiply. No bug spray will kill them and if you squish them, they're just going to smell like a pair of sweaty socks. Our biosecurity team are checking luggage and containers for these unwanted hitchhikers. So please check your trees, your fruits and your flowers for stink bugs. To identify the brown marmorated stink bug, their shape is similar to other common bugs. Like the green veggie or brown soldier bugs, the brown marmorated stink bug is bigger. Their unique markings include white banding on the antenna and black and white markings on their lower back. And don't forget, they really stink. So join the bug hunt. See it, catch it. Call us on 1-800-084-881. Our farmers will thank you for it. Okay, great. So that was just a, a short snippet um, from our primary industries. Um, so everyone, uh, again, welcome. My name is Matt McMillan. I am the Chief Sales Officer for Australia and New Zealand here at Rodic Logistics. And my colleague here, uh, Mr. Kane McCulloch, who heads up our national brokerage team for Rodic Australia. Um, now, just since the BMS speed measures began several years ago, um, Kane has, has played a, an integral part and has been very much engaged with the, the department and industry representatives, uh, building and reviewing the BMS speed measures here in, in, uh, in Australia. So last year, uh, fortunate for us, is that Kane was actually part of the department an industry joint committee that developed the BMSB measures and processes that we see here today. So welcome Kane and um, thanks very much for putting the presentation together today and um, we look forward to um, to going through everything and in a little bit more detail. So I do understand that we have a lot of questions. So our customers um, have pre-registered, uh, provided quite a few questions. Uh, and obviously this is a live event everyone, so we do have questions coming through from our customer base. So thank you very much again for your attendance and uh, we'll, we'll uh, hand it over to Kane. Yeah, thanks Matt. Uh, pleasure to be here and great to see such a good turnout from our customers. Uh, we do have a presentation for you today. Uh, just bear with us a moment while we load the slides and then we'll kick some kick things off. Okay, here we are. Today's topics. First, we're going to review last year's BMSB season. Then we'll dive into the up and coming season, the 2021 BMSB risk season. And we'll touch on what importations require treatment, what are the treatment types, and are there any exemptions? Also, the considerations you'll need to make before shipping. Thereafter, we'll have our Q&A. So review of last season. 
we saw over 150,000 containers subject to the BMSB measures, including over 9,000 LCL containers uh, also. 43% were treated offshore, and with 210 approved treatment providers across 27 countries, they produce 75,000 treatments. If we take a look at the comparison in the last two seasons and the detection points, while the number of bugs found alive pre-intervention remain quite static, the number of bugs found alive post biosecurity, so after intervention, has reduced from 31 to four, proving that the measures the department have in place are successful and have managed the risk appropriately. So what issues and challenges did industry face last year? Firstly, we saw six offshore treatment providers get suspended. What that meant was consignments on the water or arriving to Australia subsequently required treatment again in Australia, resulting in additional costs and delays. The reason I'm told for these suspensions was failing on-site biosecurity audits, these providers issuing fraudulent certificates and failing onshore consignment inspections. So where live BMSB are found in containers that were treated. We saw the limitations around offshore treatment providers again. As temperatures fall, offshore treatment facilities fail to meet the minimum temperature requirements to effectively treat the goods. Generally, we see as the origin winters get colder, more onshore fumigation commences. We saw a couple of delays onshore also in the treatment facilities. Uh, there was backlogs in some states at some providers up to four weeks. Uh, the same challenge again with container packing exists uh, where there's overutilized and shrink wrapped or plastic wrapped. Uh, that then created a backlog in the 4.7 depots of up to 12 weeks. And we'll touch on that later in the presentation. We saw again containers accidentally packed containing high risk goods. So uh, a good example of that is a food uh, importer throwing in a barbecue set of tongs or hand tools, which are classified as high risk, meaning the entire container requir requires treatment. We saw some department processing delays also uh, one in clearing off completed onshore treatments and two in inspection turnaround times. This is our 2021 BMSB flyer. It's a really handy tool and it highlights all the core information of the BMSB measures. I actually have a copy on my desk at all times. It's, it's a great quick reference guide to check the countries and the and the commodities, the products. Um, we have distributed this to our customers. And if you don't have a copy, we will issue uh, one after this webinar as well. So what's changed for the 2021 BMSB season? Well, the answer is not too much. Um, the main change is the addition of four new countries. So added to the list is now Portugal, Moldova, the Ukraine and Kazakhstan. So apart from this, basically the measures are the same. And it's really good news because every year we're seeing industry capacity to treat goods, improve and expand. So we've got more treatment facilities offshore and in Australia than ever before. And with only the addition of four small trading countries, in this year's measures, I think we're going to see a significant improvement and the supply and demand of treatment will level out, uh, thus reducing the delays we, we see. And I guess industries also learn a lot over the past seasons. 
including how to manage the risk, costs and service effectively. And this is the insight I want to provide to you today. So I'm going to explain the measures in a way that assists you in determining if your imputations will require treatment. To simplify, I'll break it down into three steps. So one, are your goods manufactured or originating in a risk country? Two, are they classified as high risk? And three, are they imported as sea freight during the BMSB season? So what is the BMSB season? Well, simply put, treatment is required for goods exported between the 1st of September till the 30th of April, 2021. So you might've seen on some publications, the BMSB measures go to the 31st of May. Well, the intervention goes to the 31st of May. And I'll, I'll explain, I'll explain this. Uh, I'll try to use two examples. So example one, if goods are shipped in April and they arrive in May, they will still require treatment. Example two is if goods are shipped in May and then arrive in May or in a month after that, they don't require treatment. So goods require treatment if they are exported, shipped from the 1st of September, 2020 till the 30th of April, 2021. So step one is to identify if you have importations from a risk country. So in addition to these countries, there's also the watch list, which are the department's emerging countries and monitoring countries lists. So it's important to note that handful of countries is not part of the BMSB measures. However, if they do find or detect BMSB throughout the season, things could change. So it's good to be aware of. So we know we have goods coming from a risk country. Step two is to identify the classification of your goods. So there's high risk, risk, and then exempt. High risk require mandatory treatment. Risk can promote some onshore random inspections, but treatment is not mandatory. So tariffs not listed are exempt, unless of course they're part of a consignment or a container that contains target high risk goods. So on the right here, you'll see our BMSB calculator. We complete these for, for our customers free of charge. This can be a really handy tool because it assists with identifying goods in the risk categories and you can potentially formulate a strategy to minimize your treatment requirements. So an example would be excluding the high risk goods from your FCL containers to you know, allow them to be imported without treatment requirements. So far, we have identified we have high risk goods imported from a risk country. So now we need to take a look at the transport requirements. So break bulk, open top and flat rack require mandatory offshore treatment. If these goods arrive untreated, they will be prevented from discharge and directed from for re-export. Last season, the department had to re-export 40 break bulk shipments. So the next category is containers. So all containers that have high risk goods require treatment, but this can be done onshore or offshore. As mentioned before, there are many goods that are not classified as high risk. However, if they are part of a consignment or a container that contains high risk goods, they will require treatment. So if you have an LCL shipment that cannot be treated, air freight usually is the best option. 
However, please speak to your key account manager and we can work on a tailored solution for your situation. Generally, these solutions do contain a higher level of risk and cost, but it's definitely worthwhile reviewing. Treatment types. So we know your import requires treatment. So how do we get them treated and what do you need to consider? Well, treatment must be performed by an approved treatment provider. And there are three options to choose from. Heat, methyl bromide and sulfuryl fluoride. I always struggle to say that. So really important to note, while there's these three options, they're not all available in all locations. So an example is methyl bromide is prohibited in Europe, while it's by far the most commonly used in Australia. So before treating, ensure the treatment will not affect your products. Ensure there's adequate space and the goods are not plastic wrapped and ensure that the post-treatment window timeframes have been satisfied. So what they are is if you've got containerized cargo and you have the container treated or the goods treated, the container must be sealed within 120 hours of treatment. And if you've got a break bulk row row or flat rack shipment, they must be loaded on the vessel within 120 hours from treatment. So this rule applies for all goods treated before the 1st of December. And again, very important to note, break bulk cargo, including the open tops and flat racks, if they have not met this requirement, they will be denied discharge and directed for re-export. So what happens if you have a container that arrives, it's untreated, and it's deemed not suitable for standard treatment? Well, there's two options here. It's to have it re-exported, or two, to utilize a 4.7 treatment facility. So what is a 4.7? It's an approved quarantine depot that can treat the contents of a container that are not suitable for standard treatment. Example, there's no adequate airspace, it's heavily utilized, it's covered in plastic, it prevents the effective treatment of the goods. We get a lot of questions on how they work too. Um, so I'll do my best to explain. The container, is, is butted up against it, this, this chamber and sealed off. The container doors are then opened into the chamber and the contents of the container are unpacked into the chamber and prepared for the treatment. So that's plastic slashing and whatever else is required. Both the chamber and the container then undergo treatment. So what's the cost? Well, last year we saw uh, on average throughout industry, roughly 10 times the cost for a 4.7 versus a standard container treatment. Uh, the other reason it's really important to avoid is the extensive delays. Uh, as I mentioned, when we were looking at last year, we saw up to 12 weeks in some states and treatment providers. So how do you mitigate this risk? There's the two main, two main uh, ways. Have your containers treated offshore. Why? Well, if there is an issue with the packing, it can be solved at origin. You're allowed to unpack the contents of the container. So you're looking at additional costs to adjust the contents of the container and make it suitable for treatment. As opposed to here on shore, you can't unpack the container without the 4.7. So if it's identified as not suitable for, for container treatment, it's your only option, as I mentioned before. 
The other way to mitigate the risk is obviously to review and audit how you, your supplier packs the containers and ensure they are suitable for treatment. So a lot of customers ask, packing correctly, what is correctly? So I want to dive into that just a little bit more. So in order to conduct effective BMSB treatment, goods must be presented in a manner that allow the heat or fumigation to reach all the external and internal surfaces of the goods that are or were accessible to BMSB. The key factors that affect the suitability of goods for treatment are free airspace and the packing type. So before I touch on both of those, approved treatment providers are the ones that are responsible for determining if a container is suitable for treatment. While they all use the same methodologies, it is important to note different treatment providers do have different equipment and technologies. So packing requirements can differ between locations and the providers. So space, well, as I mentioned, must be available between and around the goods. It's also that a fan is placed within the container or the enclosure to circulate the fumigant. So it needs to be space for that. And also there's, there's a number of fumigant monitor, monitoring tubes and the temperature sester, test sensors that need to be placed in required locations throughout the container. So if they can't get to those locations, it's automatically deemed not suitable for, for treatment. When we look at the packing, it's basically goods must not be wrapped or covered in a way that stops them uh, again from, uh, from from stops the fumigant from accessing all the all the surfaces uh, where the bug could have accessed previously. If if plastic wrapping or packaging is applied as part of the goods manufacturing process, it's deemed as commercial packing and is exempt from these packing rules. Uh, good examples like a Barbie doll packed in its plastic box and plastic wrapped for retail sale. That's considered commercial packing and isn't bound by those plastic wrapping rules. Should you, con should you treat your containers offshore or onshore? This is a very common question I get asked, and we had such a strong response from our customers, I decided to make it its own slide. We like to work together with our customers individually to determine the best approach for their scenarios. And with three different treatment options and 37, 38 origin countries, you know, and they're importing into many Australian states, there really is no one size fits all approach. So we generally use a three-stage assessment, cost, service, and risk. So we have a look at the costs, what's most effective offshore or onshore, and will the service or the risk impact, potentially impact the costs? So when we're looking at service, are there any treatment delays in either of these locations, or will treating offshore result in missing a sailing? And the main risk is uh, if you're heavily utilising your containers, may they be deemed not suitable for standard treatment? And if so, you may wish to be risk adverse and have them treated offshore based on, on that risk alone. So this year's exemptions. Safeguard arrangement scheme. Now, last year, the Safeguard Arrangement Scheme began. The department engaged industry on a trial basis to iron out the management, the application processes and the benefits. Um, and it's, it's, it's live from day one this year. Applications have opened. Uh, and I'm a really big supporter of this scheme. It, it provides an alternative to otherwise quite rigid measures 
Um, so um, I, I think it's going to be it's going to be successful. Uh, so how does it work? Well, basically it allows certain goods and supply chains to be recognised for their ability to manage biosecurity risks offshore. Uh, and this enables you to avoid treatment requirements. So currently there's only four approved safeguard arrangements. However, I'm sure that list is going to grow significantly uh, as we get closer to the beginning of this season. So there's some prerequisites. So you have to import 50 TEU, so 50 20 foot containers within the BMSB season, so 50 or more. Also out of scope for the safeguard arrangements are onshore supply chains, LCL shipments, and goods that have complex supply chains. So many to many relationships. So if you're good to, you've got 20 different suppliers in you know, five different countries and you've got a hub where you, uh, it's a free PL that you store goods and basically complex supply chains. Uh, the last one is if there's already biosecurity measures in place to manage other risks. So like your giant African snails and Asian gypsy moths, etc. Et so a couple of other exemptions that did exist last year is the emergency services. A again, very strict scope. I uh, used the example last year of the uh, helicopter uh, that was for firefighting duties that was imported without treatment uh, and it was directed for re-export. Um, so don't count on don't count on that one. Uh, the other one is the new and unused field uh, test goods. Uh, so goods classified from chapter 82 to 89 that are manufactured on or after the 1st of December do not require treatment and you just need that declaration to support it. Uh, goods that are shipped outside the season, obviously. And if you have a container packed and sealed prior to the 1st of September uh, and it sails within 21 days, uh, that's also exempt from the measures. And the obvious one uh, is the air freight option also. So that's it for the presentation. Uh, in closing, I'll just say the department and industry continue to work together to identify best practice. Being measures that control risk while minimising the impact on international trade. Well, well done, Kane. Uh, very informative. And um, again, I think we've covered quite a bit um, for the subject. Uh, however, we do have quite a few questions. So thank you for, for those people that obviously have registered and sent us questions. We've also received questions live uh, during the event. Um, before we move into the Q&A though, just for everyone's reference, we will be sending out a uh, information pack uh, just covering pretty much the whole webinar. Uh, and again, we just want to stress that if we don't get to all the questions, um, please don't hesitate to send us an email. Um, we're more than happy to um, to contact you um, for you know to discuss any other questions that potentially uh, we haven't managed to answer today, uh, just because there's, there are, there are quite a few here and there is a lot of uh, customers obviously that have attended. Um, so thank you very much. It's been a great event so far. Um, so let's um, move into the Q and A, okay? And um, hope you're ready for this, Mark. But uh, first question: So wooden products. Uh, do we treat twice for BMSB and wood? That's a good question. Um, so they're both bound by quarantine rules and regulations and uh, can require treatment. Mm -hmm. So there's a difference in the treatment requirements, uh, different rates of, uh, of treatment. Um, so higher levels of uh, methyl bromide, for example, or wood. So you can potentially get caught out and have to fumigate your or treat your goods twice okay. if you do it the wrong way around. Um, so it's important 
uh, to ensure that the goods are treated to manage the solid wood risk because mm -hmm. that will cover both the brown marmorade stink bug requirements and the wood so effectively killing two birds with one stone or at uh, today's event we'll say uh, two bugs with one stone <laughs> <laughs> Oh, couldn't That's help that one. one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, second question. Uh, this is an interesting one, actually. Um, we've had a couple like this. So, uh, is ESC, which is, you know, ESC is a product that uh, Rolig actually developed on the back of COVID-19, or should I say enhanced, um, just to obviously work very closely with our customers. But the question is, is it an option to avoid treatment? Oh, sorry, uh, the ESC, ESC yes. yes. That's it. That's a good question. So the, the the department's measures basically state anything that arrives into Australia by sea freight is bound by the BMSB measures. Okay. So if you've got high risk goods, they will require treatment. However, last year we saw the department relax the ASC uh, pathway for a certain period of time for a certain scope. Of, um, of imports. So we are discussing that with the department. Now industry represent representatives are supporting it as well. Okay. Um, hopefully there's some, we get some traction in that space and ASC is a viable option to avoid treatment in this coming season. But currently, uh, as of today, it's, it's, not, it's not an option. Treatment requirements are still uh, in, in play. You know. Okay. All right. No, no. Thank you very much for that. Uh, let's move on now. Uh, third question could be open to interpretation, so I don't quite know. It just basically asks foodstuffs. So I assume is this obviously foodstuffs are exempt, but if you could just elaborate a little bit more on that, okay? Yeah, that, that's correct. Foodstuffs themselves, their their tariff classifications are uh, exempt from the BMSB measures. However, if they're packed or consolidated with high risk goods, Mm -hmm. they, they will also themselves require treatment. So it's important that you ensure the, their shipping method uh, avoids any treatment requirements. So some examples of that would be uh, if you've got enough freight to pack your own FCL box, you make sure that there's you know only the foodstuffs in there. Mm -hmm. uh, and another pathway is obviously just air freight. Um, and as I mentioned in the presentation as well, there are services out there, FAK services, where you can ship LCL untreated. However, it does pose a significant risk because you're relying on uh, others who are all consolidating with you to do the right thing and make sure that they don't have any high risk goods within their shipments. So, yeah, proceed with caution in that space. Okay, interesting. All right, thank you. Um, nice plug on the uh, air freight there, so thank you, Kane goes a long way in the logistics area anyway. So um, let's move on. Uh, I heard onshore packaging adjustments are now allowed and 4.7s are not required. Okay. 4.7s are definitely still required uh, and they play a big part in managing uh, the, the risk and treating containers that can't otherwise effectively be treated, as I mentioned in the presentation. I think what that's alluding to is a is some commentary or a publication uh, by the department or or somewhere else perhaps uh, where they said where they talk about packing adjustments. So these are this is just a little bit of flexibility for the treatment providers to do slight, very small adjustments to containers prior to treatment. Okay. So that might be moving a few boxes around to fit the fan in. Uh, if they've got access to slash a bit of plastic that, that is preventing the goods from treatment. It's it's not an overhaul of the container. So 4.7s are definitely still required and will be used this season. Okay, great. All right, that's good. Um, another question here is how do I know if the treatment provider is available again this year? Yes, so the, the department uh, was a little bit slow in providing this information to industry this year, but it's up and available on their website now. And we're seeing more and more approved treatment providers uh, drop into that list uh, day by day. So uh, we'll have a, we'll share the link to that uh, 
department web page where you can see that list as well uh, in our information pack. Mm. No, certainly I think the market is getting a lot more mature in regards to the BMSB um, and I think that uh, as we progress uh, obviously this information should come a lot sooner uh, leading up to obviously 2021 and 2022 and, and beyond. Yes, yes. Let's hope so. Yes, yes. The pressure's on, Kane. Um, now, we're just uh, another question just in regards to 4.7. Um, but last year I had a big delay at 4.7. Are we expecting the same this year? I expect 4.7s will still be utilised, but we've also seen more service providers uh, come to the market mm. uh, with the. Uh, the service of performing 4.7 treatments, mm -hmm. as well as there's a lot more education out there as well. So I hope our customers especially are, are well aware of the packing requirements and avoid the use of 4.7. So with those with those two changes this season, I hope that the 4.7 delays are significantly less than what we've experienced previously. OK, all right, that's good to know. Um, all right. This one here, we've had a product which is shipped from Portugal. Uh, it cannot be treated due to the glue component and cannot be fumigated because one part is made out of cork. Other than air freight, which is very expensive at the moment, what option do we have to freight? So off the top of my head, cork is a high risk product. Mm -hmm. So therefore it requires mandatory treatment. Okay. If the goods cannot physically be treated because it's going to damage the product, that that leaves you in between a rock and a hard place. Um, there are only there only are a few options, and I guess it goes back to the food uh, examples we provided before. Yes. You're, uh, the only difference is that food's exempt, and whereas uh, cork is high risk, so if the only pathway uh, that's available there is is air freight or potentially if a, if a transshipment service is available, C and then air, that would be also an option. Other than that, if if you've got a significant amount of volume, say uh, like on the safeguard arrangement slide, 50 TAU or more, you could potentially look into becoming uh, yeah, an, approved for safeguarding and avoid treatment through that avenue. Okay, great. All right. And another one that's uh, popped up uh, similar to yesterday actually is um, is the NUFT available for break bulk? So NUFT, uh, new and unused field test, uh, that's the exemption that we shared. Uh, so if your goods are made and manufactured after the 1st of September, December, they are exempt from BMSB treatment. So Break box also included in that. However, uh, it's, it's just very important that you know you're starting to talk about big machinery here. The department does require that all the integral parts or com big components within that machine are also manufactured after the 1st of December to qualify for the new and unused field test uh, mm -hmm. exemption. Sure. Yep. All right, that's good. So we've got a few, we've got a couple of uh, live questions here that have just come through as well. Um, now the first one uh, is anonymous, but uh, first of all, shout out to my amazing account manager Andrew Nathan. Well, well done, Andrew Nathan. He's our uh, CAM based in uh, Adelaide, so very good to hear. Thank you. Uh, but secondly, I'm trying to determine what qualifies as commercial packing to enable sealed bags to remain unopened during fumigation. Very good question. Yes, it is. Um, so commercial packing, uh, simply explained, is packing for retail sale. So uh, it's it's not a packing that you that you have on a product to secure it for for transport or shipping. It's packing that secures the product for retail sale. So like on the shelf or the like. Yeah. Um, that's basically it. So it's it's usually packing that forms part of the manufacturing process rather than the shipping process. Okay, great. All right, and I think we'll just take the last question now, folks. Um, which is this is from Chris Atwood. What happens with a mixed high 
and no risk load where the no risk might be plastic wrapped? That's a really, really good, good question. question. So technically, if the goods arrived and and that was highlighted, if we had enough documentation to support that the plastic wrapped shipment was and did contain only low risk and everything else was you know slashed and prepared in a way that could be treated um, treatment could be conducted however we would try to avoid this situation at all costs so example is if this was uh, if, if this was coming through rolling services where we consolidate a box our teams are making sure that the containers can be treated are suitable for treatment, whether that's happening offshore or onshore. So mm. um, that low risk shipment that's been plastic wrapped would have been perforated or slashed in a way that enables uh, treatment just to ensure we don't have any hiccups. Yeah, OK. All right, that's great. Well, uh, again, very detailed um, presentation, Kane. So thank you very much. Uh, I think we've covered pretty much everything in regards to BMSB, but of course, uh, there might be something that you um, haven't asked, uh, would like to after the event, so you have our contact details, um, or please reach out to your local representative. Uh, we're more than happy to talk to you um, on the subject of BMSB uh, or any other related subjects. It's a, it's a very important subject coming in you know, up to the industry as of 1st of September, so only a couple of weeks away, um, and can have a major impact on, on supply chain. So. We're aware of it. Uh, we've put a lot of measures in place. Kane is obviously part of the actual um, the industry and process uh, that's setting some of these rules. So we have the subject matter expert here. So please don't hesitate to reach out to us or your account managers or any other representative from Bodic, and uh, we're more than happy to, to help you. Again, we will be sending out a information pack following this event. And uh, again, thank you to those uh, customers from Australia, from New Zealand, and from all over the world that have uh, attended here today. I, I hope that we've um, uh, basically answered everything that you wanted to hear. Uh, and again, if there's something, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you very much. Have a great day and thank you, Kane. It's, uh, it's been great uh, and I really appreciate everything you've um, you put together for us here today. So well done. Yeah, thank you, Matt. And thanks everybody for tuning in. I hope you found the information valuable. Cool. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye.